What you think you know about human trafficking might actually be wrong, but also it's not your fault because it's a problem that's been severely impacted by misinformation over the last several years. And as we've seen, that misinformation can have serious consequences, right? It impacts efforts to combat actual trafficking and it can also create setbacks for victims and survivors. And because we want to try to unpack all this, we spoke to Megan Cutter, the director of the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And one of the things she did is she explained that when a piece of misinformation takes off, it can bog down the hotline and law enforcement and take them away from more pressing concerns. For example, in 2020, during the um, Wayfair conspiracy, we received a 400% increase in calls, texts, and chats to the National Human Trafficking Hotline over a, a very short period of time, which made it harder for us to actually help people who needed assistance um, and who were trying to get through to get help versus people who I think generally very well intentioned were trying to report something that was both all the information was really publicly available and being reported in the media and also was law enforcement confirmed to be something that was not happening. Right, and the Wayfair example was one really big, elaborate conspiracy that blew up. But there are also much smaller, more everyday pieces of misinformation that have taken off, and you've probably encountered some through TikTok. Videos about your car tagged by zip ties or menus are getting lured in by abandoned car seats. But the thing is, Polaris, the nonprofit that operates the National Human Trafficking Hotline, they've debunked these time and time again, noting that this image that we have of victims being kidnapped by random strangers is inaccurate, because most victims were actually coerced by people they know, like their family, or their romantic partner. But the Department of Health and Human Services also noting that the image that we have of people being physically held or bonded, it's often inaccurate as well, as traffickers mostly use psychological means of control with them explaining. Fear, trauma, drug addiction, threats against families, and a lack of options due to poverty and homelessness can all prevent someone from leaving. Some individuals who experience trafficking may also be manipulated or believe they're in love with their trafficker, which can make them resistant to seeking help. And adding that traffickers might isolate victims from their families and control their money, their ID, their documents, all to trap them. But the videos explaining these realities, they just don't always get as much traction as the ones with misinformation. And that can even impact a victim's perception of trafficking, right? It makes it harder for them to identify themselves as a victim. And it can also make it harder for them to share their stories later on. Some of the things that we've seen online when there is a lot of misinformation happening about trafficking is that people who speak out and say, you know, I'm a survivor of trafficking and this is how my situation happened, often face kind of backlash from other people online who say, that's not true. This is how this really happens. And so I think it can really uh, impact the way people who are survivors of, of trafficking are able to tell their story and are believed and are seen in, in the public sphere. Right, we also have Cutter noting that these people spreading these false ideas often have good intentions, even if they're wrong. And it is important to note and understand that right, because shaming people actually doesn't do much to fight against misinformation. Right, most of the time, they're not intentionally trying to interfere with efforts to fight trafficking. But the videos that go viral are genuinely scary, right? They stoke a lot of panic. And maybe some of these people have encountered a potentially threatening situation. Right? If you think you're being followed or you see something odd in public, yeah, use those street smarts. If you feel unsafe, still assess the situation. But to label everything that looks potentially dangerous as a human trafficking ploy, it's just not productive. I think it really takes away from people understanding how trafficking really happens and also takes attention and resources and conversation away from understanding that trafficking is inherently this exploitation of power and control and that, you know, people are often in a trusting relationship with their trafficker. And so it switches the conversation to something that doesn't help us actually prevent or identify trafficking. And there are a lot of reasons that many people just inherently have a false image of what trafficking looks like. For example, in the past, Polaris has called out the Liam Neeson film Taken as a piece of media that really drove those false images home. It created a lot of fear. Solid movie, though. I pretty much always buy a ticket to watch Liam Neeson punch people. But Polaris noting that all these years later, the hotline's still dealing with the consequences of that movie, which, you know, spread false narratives about kidnapping, as well as stereotypes about it being like things that happen abroad and not stateside. Even when I'm just talking with folks about what my job is, nine times out of 10, someone brings up the movie taken. So it's very much part of the way we talk about human trafficking, even though it's not how we see human trafficking happening inside the in the United States. Right, with Cutter going on to say that even though it was just a movie, it spawned massive cultural ripple effects. And because these myths and these false narratives have become so pervasive and ingrained in our culture, there's a lot of work that has to be done to clear things up. And also with that, you had Cutter noting that social media platforms themselves should really make sure they combat misinformation that spreads on their platform. Also being able to think about how do we amplify the voices of people who've actually experienced trafficking survivors who are out there sharing their stories to correct the narrative. I think that's a, a really meaningful way to be able to understand how trafficking really happens is to listen to the people who've been in those situations themselves and hear from them and amplify and, and, and share their stories. And with all this, Cutter also adding that discussing this issue requires a lot of sensitivity and no one should ever be forced to share their story. We make a real effort to share those stories on our own social media. We work in partnership with survivors to do that, making sure that they you know, consent and, and are comfortable sharing. Also, something that is really important is 
um, when you're asking someone to, to share information about their experience to compensate them appropriately for their labor. And I think that's something that we've talked a lot about in the anti-trafficking field because trafficking is a crime that inherently exploits people. And so making sure in that sharing of information we're not re-exploiting anyone. And the compensation aspect is one that probably not a lot of people think about, right? But, you know, how often are you watching a documentary or a show or you see an awareness ad about some kind of tragic situation and it feels really emotionally manipulative or exploitive of the source material? And this act of sort of vulturously capitalizing on someone's trauma could prevent people down the line from sharing their own stories, right? They might not want to be the next face out there. So that compensation element, obviously in combination with consent, it's, it's possibly a step to balance the situation to make sure there's no further exploitation. But with all that said, at this point, you might be wondering, what can actually be done to prevent trafficking. And well, with that, I mean, you previously had the director of the University of New Hampshire's Crimes Against Children Research Center explaining to HuffPost, some people are just more vulnerable than others, and we could do a lot more to prevent trafficking by addressing those vulnerabilities, like family abuse, neglect, or foster care placement directly. Right? And also just creating a better understanding of all this helps as well. Right? If you see a well-intentioned person spreading misinformation, is there a way to try and turn that situation around? Harness those good intentions to help people see where in their communities they actually really could support victims and survivors of trafficking or where they may actually know and engage with people in sex or labor trafficking situations and how they could help. So sort of turning that good intention into a good action and, and offering a correction on you know where that energy could, could be best used. And also, I'll just add, if you are someone who is concerned or you're further interested in this topic, look at reputable organizations and sources who have been in this field for years. See what those groups are saying. Use that information instead of just seeing a random thing on social media. Because as a propaganda cartoon back in the day used to tell me correctly, knowing is half the battle. But for now, where I'll leave you is by passing the question off to you. What are your thoughts here?